Hello, my dark darlings. I'm Markia, and this is the Something Scary Podcast. To our veteran listeners and those voyaging into the dark with us for the first time, welcome. For those that don't know, I am a big sci-fi fan. Along with my usual marathons of zombie movies, I very much enjoy a good or bad sci-fi flick. In fact, I can't really tell the difference between the two. It's all gravy. Because think about it. Just when we've overcome the horror of ghosts and monsters surrounding us, look up at the night sky. Imagine the greater terror out there. What lies beyond us? Could we be their allies or are we their meat? We hear stories of sightings and disappearances and the more and more we explore out in the great beyond, the more we wonder if they're already here. First, visitors take much more than a family's hospitality. Next, the real face on the surface of Mars. After that, Romance and something else is in the air on the night of the school dance. And finally, the classic creepypasta, a gift of mercy. I receive hundreds of creepy story submissions every single week. As always, the first story you hear is one that we've chosen to animate and post over at youtube.com snarled. Then I read a few more stories for the podcast. If you have a tale you're dying to share, send me an email at somethingscary@snarl.com. And if you'd like to support the show and receive bonus content, consider joining our Patreon. Our patrons play a huge role in keeping the show running every single week. For more information on how you can help the show and also be a part of it, visit patreon.com snarled. So, wanna hear something scary? Abducted. Looking up at the stars, it's easy to wonder if we're truly alone out in space. If there's life out there, and if there is, why hasn't it made its presence known? Or maybe it has, and it's your turn next. Your turn to be at their mercy. In a way, spooky campfire stories can be comforting. If you hear a tale of an old building curse due to some tragic event, it makes you feel better because you know to just not go into that building. But how about a home less than two years old with no history of violence or bloodshed? When Lily was 12, her family moved into an almost brand new house. The previous owners had built it, but moved away after only two years, selling it for a drastically reduced price. Lily raced her brother Ethan through the hallway on their move-in day. He beat her down the long hall to claim his bedroom. Ethan was seven and incredibly fast. The room he had chosen had a giant window facing the backyard. Lily complained to their mother, Tessa. It's not fair. He gets the bigger room with a view. Lily, in a few years, you'll appreciate having your own bathroom. Trust me, her mom said. Lily rolled her eyes and stumped off to her smaller room, trying to get excited about the bathroom. Later that night, Lily was sleeping in her bed when she heard her name. Lily. A voice whispered from down the hall. She blinked her eyes open slowly, semi-awake. Had that been a dream? Listening, but hearing nothing, she started to nod off again. But before she was fully asleep, the voice whispered again, Lily. This time, Lily sat up and looked around her dark room. It had her bedroom furniture and a few unopened boxes. Lily, the tiny voice pleaded. Lily grabbed her stuffed dog toy and quietly opened her bedroom door, moving down the hall towards the voice. The hall was dark. Lily flipped on the light. There was a popping sound and the bulb went black, leaving her in a darkness so deep she could barely see her own hand. Scared but determined, Lily made her way down the hall. Lily, the voice whispered desperately. She recognized the voice now. It belonged to Ethan. Why was he speaking so softly? Turning the knob on Ethan's bedroom door, Lily pushed it open, clutching her stuffed animal under her arm. Something grabbed her hand in the dark. It was Ethan. Somewhat frantic, he pulled her into the room. Lily, look, outside. Lily edged forward past him, focused through the window to see two pairs of green eyes glowing back in the distance. Goosebumps formed on Lily's skin. The eyes stared at her, then past her toward Ethan. 
A bright light exploded inside the bedroom. Lily dropped her toy, shielding her eyes. Suddenly, in the bedroom with them stood two dark figures, the ones with the green eyes from outside. They towered over Ethan, eyes blazing. Lily froze in fear. Terrified, Ethan turned to her, whimpering, Lily, before the light exploded a second time, then all went dark. Ethan and the two creatures were gone. Ethan, she screamed, but the room was silent. Running to their parents' bedroom, Lily burst inside, sobbing, she told them what happened. They ran into Ethan's bedroom, but all trace of him and those haunting green eyes were nowhere to be found. Ethan's disappearance was reported as a kidnapping. The town rallied behind the family to search the neighboring forest and the lake, looking for any sign of the little boy. But days turned into weeks, and it became all too clear that he was just gone. The family was devastated and immediately put the house up for sale. On their last night in the house, Lily startled awake at midnight, feeling herself drawn to her brother's bedroom. Again, she walked down the hall, flipping the light, it popped, leaving the hallway in darkness as she slowly opened Ethan's door. There, standing in the middle of the bedroom, was Ethan. In the moonlight, he looked much older than when she'd last seen him. She ran to him and wrapped him in a hug. Lily, he said, collapsing in her arms. The family was determined to leave the dark memory of Ethan's disappearance behind them and move to another town far away. But Ethan was never the same. The little boy who had whined at doing even the tiniest household chore now washed the dirty dishes, took out the trash, made his bed every day first thing in the morning, all without being asked. Their parents would joke that it was like he wasn't even really Ethan anymore. When Lily asked how he had come back, Ethan grew quiet and said that he didn't remember most of it but that the visitors were after children, that they had told him that something far worse was coming for them all, but he couldn't remember what it was. As for Lily, on the night of Ethan's return, she had caught one final glimpse of the two pairs of green, glowing eyes in the backyard. She couldn't tell how she knew, but she had felt them staring into her that last time, almost as if they had been saying, see you soon. If you haven't had the chance to try out Best Fiends yet, give it a go. I've played the puzzle game Best Fiends for a while now, and one of the things I love about it is that the longer I play, the more challenging and fun it gets. Uh, it's a casual mobile game that's a lot of fun because along with the super cute bug characters you can collect, you get to change up your strategy the higher in levels you go. So it's never boring. In fact, Best Fiends also updates the game monthly, so each month you can look forward to new levels plus monthly themed challenges. Another thing I really enjoy about Best Fiends is that it doesn't need an internet connection. So I can take a quick break, whip out my phone, and enjoy some puzzles whenever I want. Best Fiends has thousands of levels already, with new levels, events, and characters added every month. It's hours of fun right at your fingertips, and you can even play offline. With over 100 million downloads and tons of five-star reviews, Best Fiends is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R, Best Fiends. Hey, my dark darlings. Buffy, the eco-friendly and cruelty-free bedding company, is one of the sponsors for Something Scary. Their bedding is made out of sustainable and recycled materials. I tried out their latest comforter, it's called The Breeze. When I sleep with other comforters, I sleep either too hot or too cold. Then I'm either piling blankets on or pushing them off instead of getting good sleep. But when I sleep with The Breeze, it actually regulates my temperature. My body focuses more on getting good sleep because the breeze keeps me cozy all night long without overheating. The breeze is made of hypoallergenic eucalyptus fabric inside and out, and is cruelty free, meaning no down is used. The breeze just brings wellness to bed. Why not choose 100% plant-based bedding that's better for you and the earth? Plus, Buffy offers a free trial. You can try a comforter in your own bed for free. If you don't love it, return it at no cost. For $20 off your Buffy comforter, visit buffy.co and enter SCARY. Remember, to get $20 off your Buffy comforter, go to buffy.co and enter the promo code SCARY.
Telescopes and new technology help us look at the surfaces of moons and planets. Imagine if one of those planets looked back. This story is inspired by the real face on Mars. Resting on the surface of Cydonia sits a face on a mound. For over 50 years, we set it as a warning to them. We knew they could see us. Our warning was issued and left ignored. They arrived anyways. Machines touched down on our soil, legs and incisors probing life, and then came the great storm. The disruption of their ships landed with a power we'd never seen. We hid from the faceless beings stalking our world. We hid to prepare to fight back in the shadow of the storm. They didn't see us coming. We ripped through their equipment, tore their emblems of some place we did not want to know. We got close and obliterated them quickly, pulling at their faceless heads, protection from our atmosphere, weak beings that died upon contact. Their blood boiled and burned out of their pores. Their final gasps showed signs of intestine collapse. Quickly, we decimated this lesser kind. They didn't belong here. We left their bodies strewn, forever frozen in the horror of their painful final moments. A warning to go with the mask of death we'd built on our mound. We knew there were more of them on the way. They're not welcome here. We're not sure how, but a storm seems to have taken out the first crew that landed on Mars. Secondary crew will have to investigate. We need to find out what happened. This is part of the original content that Something Scary is saying that we want to bring to you. So uh, Sabina Graves, our coordinator, and then also myself, put this together. This is inspired by the real face on Mars. And that's a question for you. Do you think of aliens? And if you do, do you think that they would see us as invaders as we explore our solar system? It's something to ponder, because we consider them invaders, don't we? Do you remember your first school dance? In this story inspired by Jeffrey, students have a night they'll never forget. There had been a strange phenomenon in the night sky over Warren High School on the night of the school dance. A big meteor had streaked through the sky, leaving particles of dust behind. The dust reflected beautifully, glittering and hovering through the night air. Ashlyn, my date, looked just as radiant as all of the blue and purple hues among the stars. I was slow dancing with her outside near the school gym. It would have been a truly magical night if her father, Mr. Mingus, hadn't somehow gone insane. Everything had started off fine. Mr. Mingus had the windows down while driving us to the school dance. Pulling into the school's parking lot, the two of us watched the meteor as he boasted about his new speaker system he just had installed in the car. Then he just started twitching. Convulsions slammed into him, his body thrashing in his seat. The SUV was all over the place. Ashlyn was screaming. We swerved, popping the curb near the school's football field and came to a stop. Mr. Mingus's body was taut with tension. As his head jerked to the side, his mouth opened in a silent scream. Then he slumped heavily onto the car horn. Dad! Ashlyn tore open her seatbelt, running up to the front passenger side door. Is it a heart attack? Oh my God, Chris, is he breathing? I leaned between the front seats, gently pushing Mr. M off the car horn, trying to check his pulse and his airway. Coming face to face with her father's unblinking stare, I feared the worst. When suddenly, Mr. Mingus bolted awake, his face twitching and contorting. His hands came up, mashing his palms against his ears, and then he headbutted me. Shocked and in pain, I fell backwards out of the SUV, blood streaming from my nose. Mr. Mingus ignored Ashlyn's shocked yells and started jabbering. All sorts of things came out of his mouth. Most we didn't understand, but one thing he kept repeating. 
dance. You dance right now. Show me how you're going to dance with my baby Chris. Dance. When I tried to tell him he needed a doctor, he leaped out of the car, screaming and punching me, until Ashlyn grabbed me away from him and pulled me to her in a swaying motion. Lit by the headlights, blood staining the front of my tuxedo, we slow danced. As Ashlyn's dad hooted and spasmed and twitched near his car, Ashlyn whispered to me, I don't know what happened, but we have to get my dad some help. The school gym is right over there. Let's make a run for it. No secrets! Mr. Mingus thundered, revving the SUV he accelerated toward us both. We ran as he sped up and Ashlyn hopped onto the bleachers. The car swerved, nearly hitting me as she pulled me up. Sliding through the rows of benches, we reached the back end and looked back at our father. Something garbled that sounded like, Dance! was yelled back at us, and he cranked his new speaker system all the way up. Suddenly, his mouth contorted and another silent scream. His body shook and quivered like he was frozen in place. Then streams of blood poured from his ears. We ran toward the auditorium for help. Out of breath, we staggered in through the propped open doors. But when we got inside, the DJ booth was silent as frightened students were standing in rows in the middle of the dance floor. The teachers wandered amongst them, yelling, threatening nonsense, twitching, faces contorted, some smashing their hands against their ears, screaming, just like Ashlyn's dad. What's happened to them? Chris, look, it's just the adults. Ashlyn and I ducked down behind the refreshments table. Chris, she whispered urgently, Did you ever read that article where teenagers can hear frequencies adults can't? What what if the opposite is true? Maybe they're reacting to something we can't hear. But why now? I whispered back. What's so different about tonight? I trailed off as we both looked at each other and said in unison, The meteor. Remembering how Ashlyn's dad had reacted to the high decibels on the SUV's custom sound system, We hatched a plan. Ashlyn kissed me, then broke for the silent DJ booth while I ran yelling at the teachers, getting their attention, getting them to chase me toward the huge speakers. They were surprisingly quick, but I got them in position just as music blasted through the auditorium. The kids winced at the sudden change while the adults reacted like they had touched a live wire. Shaking, convulsing, blood streamed out of their ears. I ran to the gym doors, waving my classmates outside. Ashlyn caught up and we headed back to the football field when suddenly something grabbed my shoulder, spinning me around. It was Mr. Mingus. But this time, really, Mr. Mingus. His brown eyes were clear of whatever madness had gripped him earlier. His ears were bleeding and he was unsteady. Dad! Ashen yelled, hugging him tight. He whispered hoarsely over her head. It was like splinters of glass were buried deep in my ears, making me do, think, horrible things. Oh, honey, I am so sorry. He began to sob. Dad, it's okay. Whatever it was, it's over now. Ashlyn's voice was muffled against his chest, so she couldn't see it. But I saw it, and then remembered what we'd both forgotten. The forecast for tonight was for meteor showers, plural. Horrified, I looked up at the sky as more meteors blazed their path above. I looked at Mr. Mingus as he unblinkingly stared back at me. His mouth trembled and formed into a snarl. I watched as he gripped Ashlyn tighter and tighter the mania entering his eyes once again. You know, disruptions to the inner ear can lead to behavioral problems, such as hyperactivity or aggression. And meteorites have impacted Earth throughout our known history. So what could space dust or intrusive frequencies do? 
Scientifically speaking, the galaxy does sing in the sense that frequencies from it can be cataloged and heard. So maybe in this case, it had brought along a song of destruction. And now, an anonymous author from a classic creepy pasta on the internet passes along the gift of mercy. We made a mistake. That is the simple, undeniable truth of the matter, however painful it might be. The flaw was not in our observatories, for those machines were as perfect as we could make, and they showed us only the unfiltered light of truth. The flaw was not in the predictor for it is a device of pure, infallible logic, turning raw data into meaningful information without the taint of emotion or bias. No, the flaw was within us, the orchestrators of this disaster, the sentients who thought themselves beyond such failings. We are responsible. It began a short while ago, as these things are measured as photons travel. We detected faint radio signals from a blossoming intelligence outward from the galactic core. Through our observatories, we watched a world of strife and violence, populated by a barbaric race of short-lived, fast-breeding vermin. They were brutal and uncultured things which stabbed and shot and burned each other with no regard for life or purpose. Even their concepts of art spoke of conflict and pain. They divided themselves according to some bizarre cultural patterns and set their every industry to cause death. They terrified us, but we were older and wiser and so very far away, so we did not fret. Then we watched them split the atom and breach the heavens within the breath of one of their single short generations and we began to worry. When they began actively transmitting messages and greetings into space, we felt fear and horror. Their transmissions promised peace and camaraderie to any who were listening, but we had watched them for too long to buy into such transparent deceptions. They knew we were out here, and they were coming for us. The orchestrators consulted the predictor, and the output was dire. They would multiply and grow and flood out their home system like some uncountable tide of devourer worms consuming all that lay in their path. They would destroy us if left unchecked. The gift of mercy, weights of machinery, fuel and ballast. It would push itself up by light speed with this onboard fuel and then began to consume. It would be traveling at nearly their light speed when it hit. They would never see it coming. Its launch was a day of mourning, celebration, and reflection. The horror of the act we had committed weighted heavily upon us all. The necessity of our crime did little to comfort us. The gift had barely cleared the outer cometary halo when the mistake was realized. But it was too late. The gift could not be caught, could not be recalled or diverted from its path. The architects and work crews, horrified at the awful power of the thing upon which they labored, had quietly self-terminated in droves. We could only watch in shame and horror as the light of genocide faded into infrared against the distant void. Because they grew and they changed In a handful of lifetimes, they abolished war, abandoned their violent tendencies, and turned themselves to the grand purposes of life and art. We watched them remake first themselves and then their world. Their frail, soft bodies gave way to gleaming metals and plastics. They unified their people through an omnipresent communications grid and produced art of such power and emotion, the likes of which the galaxy had never seen before, or again, because of us. Sentience prepared for death. Lovers exchanged last words, separated by worlds in the tyranny of light speed. Their planet-side engineers worked frantically to build sufficient transmission infrastructure to upload the countless masses with the necessary neural modifications. 
while those above dumped lifetimes of music and literature from their data banks to make room for passengers. Those lacking the required hardware or the time to acquire it consigned themselves to death, lashed out in fear and pain, or simply went about their lives as best they could under the circumstances. The gift arrived suddenly. The light of its impact visible in our skies, shining bright and cruel. We watched and we wept for our victims. The light dimmed, the dust cleared, and our observatories refocused upon the place where their shining blue world had once hung in the void and found only dust in the pale gleam of an orphaned moon wrapped in a thin, burning wisp of atmosphere that had once belonged to his parent. Radiation and relativistic shrapnel had wiped out much of the inner system, and continent-sized chunks of molten rock carried screaming ghosts outward at interstellar escape velocities, damned to wander the great void for an eternity. The damage was apocalyptic, but not complete. From the shadows of the outer worlds, tiny points of light emerged. Thousands of fusion trails of single ships and world ships and everything in between, many survivors in flesh and steel and memory banks ready to rebuild. For a few moments, we felt relief, even joy. And we were filled with the hope that their culture and art would survive the terrible blow we had dealt them. Then came the message, tightly focused at our star, transmitted simultaneously by hundreds of their ships. This week's podcast stories were edited by Lisa Timmons, Markia McCarty, Gail Gilman, and Sabina Graves. Audio edited by Fitz Harris. Graphics by Johnny Ashley, produced by Annalise Nelson. Music by Sapphire Sandalo. If you have a story you'd like to submit, send me an email at somethingscary@snarled.com. Don't forget to watch the video version of Something Scary over at youtube.com slash snarled. And if you'd like to support the show and everything we do at Snarled, join our Patreon at patreon.com slash snarled. Until next time, my dark darlings, sweet dreams. <laughs>